بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعد ما بعد سيستز رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم returned from Taif as I mentioned to you in last uh, in the last class. He, listened, he returned from Taif and we know all that happened at the, in Taif and uh, anyone else in his place, SubhanAllah, would have been so heartbroken, so depressed that you would not blame that person if he had given up the, the, um, the mission, given up his work and um, you know, figuratively hung up his boots and said, this is, this is not the will of Allah, this cannot happen. Anyone would have done it except the Messenger of Allah, except the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is yet again one of the many pieces of evidence which proclaim to anyone with any sense of justice that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it takes an incredibly amazing level of belief in your mission in yourself an incredible absolute mountain of confidence and truly and truly a belief that can come only because he is marching to a different tune from what the world can hear. And that is the tune of the rida, of the will and the pleasure of his master, of his creator and our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalla. And that is the confidence and that is the power that kept him on without any despair, any depression, any easing of the effort, no tardiness, no laziness, not even taking any rest. The primary concern of Rasulullah Wasallam at this point was to seek a place where he, from which he could preach his message, from which he could communicate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him in safety and in and in safety and consistently. Now it's quite amazing. I mean this is something that really blows my mind, which is that one can understand if somebody has a message which is intrinsically uh, intrinsically bad, right? Something which is evil something which is harmful, that this person is uh, looking for a safe place to, uh, from which to do his work. But why should somebody whose message is clearly beneficial, this is not a secret, right? It's not something to say, here is a cult and you join this secret society and then only you will be uh, given the uh, truth about what this cult is. This is this is something which is absolutely open. Islam is the most open of the open things. There is nothing secret in Islam. Everything is up in front of you. And everything is so clearly beneficial. Yet, all that Rasulullah Wasallam is facing and all that anybody who ever did this message has ever faced is threat, is uh, is people, you know, uh, opposing them in, in various ways, which become progressively more toxic, progressively more harmful uh, if they refuse to give up. Very sad situation, because at the end of the at the end of the day, people who oppose those who speak the truth, they must think about this and reflect and say that if I am successful, I am successful in what. 
you are successful in propagating falsehood. You are so successful in propagating something which is harmful for society. You are successful in doing something which cannot possibly have any benefit for anybody. And the thing which was uh, which was possible for you to really uh, do something with and help people and help society uh, is uh, is what you put down. On a side note, see for example what happens today with uh, those who uh, who uh, promote uh, the uh, importance and the criticality of fighting uh, global warming, right, and climate change, for example, uh, do they get support? They don't get any support. These are, these are, these, these people are really, you know, people are, they just ignore them or they, I mean, they don't attack them, but they, they just ignore them and they uh, do not allow them to succeed. At the end of the day, who is going to be harmed by this? If the fight against global warming is lost, if the fight against climate change is lost, what really will be lost? The future of humanity on the face of the earth will be lost. Everybody will lose. And after a point, it will become irreversible. And I don't even know whether we have already gone past that point. But anyway, one lives in hope. So let us say that that point has not arrived yet, but it's it will arrive and it will arrive very quickly. But this is the, the peculiar, uh, you know, suicidal tendency of, uh, of human nature where uh, we oppose things which are really beneficial for us. And of course, the most beneficial thing is, uh, uh, is that which is good for us forever and ever. That is good for us for the Akhirah, for the hereafter. And that is Islam, to worship our Rabb, to worship our Creator and not anyone and anything else and to follow the way that He showed for us because this is the best way. This is the best way. You know, there can, there can be no argument about this because, see, the, the, the very simple thing is, um, for example, you will never argue that the manufacturer of a product knows what is best for that product. And anyone who doesn't want to deal in contraband and, and so on and stolen stuff, uh, if you, especially if you have a very valuable product, right, you will do for that product what the manufacturer's manual tells you to do. The maintenance of it and so on and so forth, you will not find some, you know, for example, if it's a, a Lamborghini, you bought this beautiful car and you, um, the lubricant in it and so on and you want to put some oil in it and you um, you will not say well you know let me find the cheapest oil in the market you say no no the, the, this thing whatever is the oil that the manufacturer says should be put into the Lamborghini that's what I'm going to put in and so also for everything else but when it comes to the human being and there's nothing that's more valuable than human life no product and no car and no, uh, you know, aeroplane, no nothing. The human being is the number one valuable thing on the face of the earth. At least that's what we humans think, isn't it? So who is the, what is the manufacturer's manual for the human being? That manufacturer's manual for the human being is called the Quran. Because the manufacturer of the human being is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, maintain this product in this way. And this is the way to maintain the product. <laughs> Worship no one other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eat and drink that which is good for you. Stay away from all, tox uh, all toxic stuff, intoxicants, all kinds of uh, things which, uh, you know, play with your mind. Be kind to each other, be compassionate. Don't be greedy. Don't try to grab other people's stuff because you like it. You know, all these, all these rules, I mean, these, these are for, for who? These are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are they for you and me? These rules are 
for us, the manufacturer's manual is for the benefit of the product. And the manufacturer takes the trouble to give you this manual so that you can enjoy the product. Now, we have destroyed ourselves, we have destroyed our society, we have destroyed our world. And then we wonder why we are in the kind of mess that we are in. What is the wonder? What do I, you know, what surprises me the most is this sense of uh, surprise. Hmm? What surprises me the most is this so-called sense of surprise. So now when Rasulullah returned to, uh, uh, to Makkah from Taif, uh, he was without any protection because his own family, the Quraysh, were against him. The, the, per, the person, the chief in the family, Abu Talib bin Abdul Muttalib, who was his, uh, who had given him protection, he had passed away. Um, he went to Taif in the hope that the Banu Thaqif would give him protection, but they did not, and they treated him so shabbily and so badly. So when he came back to uh, Makkah, uh, just because just before he entered Makkah, he sent a message to Uraikat, uh, a message with Uraikat to Al Akhnas bin Shuraik, asking for protection, but he refused because he was an ally of Quraysh. Um, Suhail bin Amr refused protection as he was from the Amr bin Wail and said that they could not give protection to people of Kaab bin Wail. That was Rasulullah's tribe. He then sent a message to Al Mut'am bin Ubay, who agreed. And Rasulullah spent the night in his house. The next day, Al Mut'am bin Ubay uh, took his, took seven of his sons um, who were in armor with their swords surrounding Rasulullah and then they watched over him while he made tawaf. Abu Sufyan came and said, are you giving him protection or are you following him? Mutam said, we are only giving him protection. So Abu Sufyan said, okay, then we follow, we accept your protection. Imam Zuhri, the teacher of Imam Malik, he was a great muhaddith and he compiled his hadith during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Abdul Aziz, uh, the, the Khalifa of Banu Maya. He said that Rasulullah would visit all the camps of Hajj, at the time of Hajj he would go to Mina, and he would present his faith uh, Islam and he would ask for protection and support. But every one of them refused it. Because uh, they felt that since his tribe did not accept him, uh, they would not also accept him. For example, Rasulullah met the tribe of Kinda and gave them Dawa, but they refused. Then he went to Banu uh, Abdullah, but they also turned him down. Then he went to Banu Hanifa, but they rejected him very rudely. And these Banu Hanifa uh, were the tribe of, uh, later on they were the people from whom uh, arose Musail Mal Kazab and they uh, led a very bad revolt against Rasulullah Sallallahu and, and eventually uh, Musail Mal was, was killed and the revolt was put down. But this was the Banu Hanifa, a big tribe. Uh, in the Najd. Then um, the Banu Amir bin Sasa, their leader was Bayhara bin Faras. He was very impressed with Rasulullah and he said that I swear that if I could have this brave man of Quraysh, I could eat up the Arabs with him. So he said, if we follow your orders and if Allah give us, gives us victory, uh, will we have power uh, over uh, will be a power after you, right? Uh, meaning that 
you we will we will give we will give you protection and then we will fight the arabs and if we if we are successful and we are uh, we prevail over them then we want to rule the arabs rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the earth belongs to allah and he gives it to whoever he wishes so bahara said i will to support you and then we may see the power going to someone else uh, when they returned to their homeland they spoke to an old wise man who used to live with them and he said can your act be undone can you rectify this mistake what happened to your judgment nobody among the arabs has ever made this claim before right uh, his claim must be true his claim has to be true so meaning that uh, when uh, uh, bayhara Uh, bin Faris, uh, when he asked this question that after uh, after uh, we become victorious, will we be the rulers? And can you guarantee that? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No. We, first of all, we are. He said he is not inviting them to war. He is not inviting them to uh, conquer the Arabs. He is inviting them to the truth of the Deen of Allah of Islam. And secondly, he said to them that as far as Uh, temporal power is concerned the rule is concerned allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to whoever he wants to give it to it is not allah is not compelled to give it to you or me so therefore he said abhi sir sir said i cannot guarantee this to you so bayhara left him and uh, you know he said well, what's the point if we support you and we are not the rulers this also before we go there uh, to the next of it Uh, this also shows that the importance of a class the importance of a class in everything we do the importance of sincerity in everything we do especially in the case of islam but also in everything else we do which is that if you are genuinely interested in benefit then you are interested in benefit you are in, then you are not going to go and get sidetracked by uh, temporal power and authority and money and this and that so this is what by her address so when they went back home uh they told this uh, old wise man who used to live with them and that man said what have you done uh what have you done he said can you go back and can you can you change this can you rectify this this is a huge mistake you made right to do to, to deny uh help uh, to this man he said just think about this no one ever made this claim before so the, just for that reason this claim has to be true because he said that you know this claim is so uh so powerful and uh, the fact that this person is uh, firm and steadfast on his claim despite all of the difficulties that he's facing it has to be true but of course it could not be undone they, they had gone away um in uh, another tribe banu shaiban their uh, leader had two braids up to his chest his name was mafrooq bin amr rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke to him they he, they invited him so he went there and he spoke to him and he said i ask you to bear witness that there is nobody worthy of worship except allah and that i am his messenger i ask you to give me protection until i can complete my work um so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this to him then uh, mafrooq uh, bin amr uh, asked him asked rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said um, recite something of what you have received so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited some ayat of surah al-anam and then some ayat of surah an-nahl then hani bin khubaitha one of them he said we like what you said and your words are not the words of any man uh or we would have known them however this meeting has no introduction and no uh follow up so we cannot accept your religion just now we will have to go back and consult our people as we are only a delegation so I mean, these are all excuses uh, that people you know made they some rejected him uh sallallahu alaihi wasallam just outright they, they they couldn't be bothered even to uh, uh, you know even to be 
polite. Some people who are more polite, so they say, look, this meeting is like, there's not nothing, uh, you know, you are a stranger to us and there's no introduction, no follow-up, is it? Oh, there is really nothing that we need to explain in this. Um, so despite the uh, fact that, uh, you know, he liked the words and he's saying very clearly, he said, these words are revelation. These are not the words of a man uh, or we would have recognized them because these people were experts in language and they said, we, but we will not. Then Mutharna, he said, I heard and liked what you said, but our answer should be as Hani bin Khubaita has said, that is his companion. Uh, for us to leave our religion and follow you after only one meeting will be like taking up residence between two pools of stagnant water. Yeah, again, excuses. Rasulullah asked him uh, what he meant. He said, it's being uh, between the Arabs and Khosro. Khosro is the, uh, the Iranian king. We would be reneging our pact we have with Khosro that we would not cause any incident or give refuse to any troublemaker. I imagine they're calling a source of a troublemaker. <laughs> what trouble is he making? Um, they said, this thing you suggest to us, Islam and its dawa, it's something that kings dislike. Hmm? I mean, that was, in that sense, I guess, uh, he was wise. Um, he said, the Arabs will accept excuses, but the Persians will not. Uh, if you want us to give you protection from the Arabs, we can, but not from the Persians. So now he is being, um, uh, I guess, very pragmatic in that sense. And he's saying that we are between these two people. We have, um, we have pacts with the Persians and the Arabs. <clears throat> the Arabs are small. They are, you know, they're dispersed and so on and so forth. We can protect you, but from the Persians, there's a big empire. <coughs> and he said, kings don't like what you are saying, because obviously, Rasulullah's message is that Allah is supreme, not any human being, and no king likes to hear that. And this is a, this is true to this day. I mean, imagine this: the big problem with people have with Islam is not theological. I mean, this is something very important to understand. The problem that people have with Islam, the Islamophobic people, and so on, it's not. This it has nothing to do with theology. It has everything to do with politics. It has to do with political power and authority. They don't want. Power and authority, temporal, political power and authority to go from their hands. And the moment they accept Islam, their power and authority has gone and they have to accept the power and authority of Rasulullah which comes to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So they, if they have a law which goes against the law of Islam, then they must remove this law and implement the law of Islam. Today, as, as I speak, there is not one single country, one single Muslim country in the whole world who applies the laws of Islam. Even the, 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 the ones who uh, like to call themselves the, you know, the leaders of the Muslims and the saviors and whatnot, they do not apply the laws of Islam. They apply their own laws in, in so many ways, whether it's banking, whether it's uh, alcohol, whether it's anything else, right? Uh, the, the, the legal uh, buying and selling of drugs and, and, and cigarettes and, and tobacco and what, all kinds of things. Things that and gambling and racing, race horses, gambling and whatnot. I mean, people ap apply, Muslim countries apply laws which are completely and totally. There is no great mystery. This is clearly against the laws of Islam. Yet, Muslim countries uh, follow those laws, they apply those laws, they, uh, they do not remove those laws, they do not apply the laws of Islam. Right? They call themselves Islamic the Republic and Islamic Kingdom and Islamic this, Islamic that. Just calling yourself a name does not cut any ice in Islam. It, it is something that Islamic or Islam means that you have, we have to live by Islam, which means we have to spread kindness and goodness on the earth, right? not violence and not uh, uh, all kinds of corruption. So, um, obviously kings... So this man said, he was being very pragmatic, he said, look, if we give you protection, then we are going to buy trouble with the Persians, we can't fight the Persians, so we will not do that. Now, obviously, for Rasulullah to have protection from one side and not from the other side made no sense. So Rasulullah said, "Okay, if that is the <coughs> if that is the case, that is the case." And uh, <coughs> so uh, he, he he left them. <coughs> then came the Ansar, or what came to be known, the bunch of people. 
who came to be, uh, came to be known as the Ansar, uh, they came, the people from Yathrib. Um, the Aus and the Khadraj, the, the Arab tribes of uh, Medina, they are called the Ansar when they became Muslims. Um, Adnan and Qahtan were two uh, Arab leaders and from them were two branches of Arabs. The Makkans were from Adnan and the Aus and Khazraj were from Qahtan. Rasulullah went to the camp of the Khazraj, there were six people in it, and he asked them, who are you? They said, we are Khazraj. Rasulullah invited them to Islam and they accepted these six people. They said, we have left our people because we have all kinds of problems, dissension and uh, conflict among them. So we will go back to them and we will invite them to your religion. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to unite us through you, then you will be the most beloved to us. They said, we are tired of the, uh, the fights we have because the Aus and the Khadras were constantly uh, at war with each other and they wanted that to end. They, had, they were constantly at war. They had killed off all their uh, you know, senior, senior uh, leaders and so on and uh, there was no end in sight and this was, it has got to a point where both were exhausted and they were tired of this but they didn't know how to, how to end it. So they said, well, this is, looks like a good way. Here is a man we respect and here is a religion we respect. So they said, we are going to go back and present your religion to, the, to our people and if they accept it, then uh, we will come back to you. And if this is the because of you, if this conflict among us is resolved, then you will be the most beloved to us. Um, the Arabs in Medina, they were neighbors of the Jews. The Jews lived in Medina and so the Arabs were already introduced to, to monotheism, uh, the worship of uh, one God of Allah alone. Uh, and they were also introduced to the idea that the messenger was coming. Um, so when they, whenever they had a problem, uh, a conflict with the Jews, the Jews would say, uh, they would threaten them and they would say that uh, when the Prophet comes, we will kill you like the Ad were killed, you know, we will completely wipe you out, they used to threaten them uh, when they had a, when they had any conflict. And people talk like this, so they, but that, the Jews said that because the Jews knew that there was a messenger who was coming. They, they knew, they predicted, and this is in the uh, Torah and the Injil, uh, the coming of Rasulullah has had already been announced. Uh, a few years before the Hijrah of Rasulullah there was a war between Al-Aus and Khazraj in which most, as I mentioned to you, most of the leaders of both sides got killed. So now they were leaderless and they were looking for a leader. leader. Uh, Aisha Siddiqa anha, she said that this war was really a preparation for the Hijrah of Rasulullah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through something which is by itself negative, I mean there is no such thing as a good war, uh, or all wars are negative and that is why Islam does not permit uh, just fighting for the sake of fighting, you know, just campaigning for uh, for power and for uh, you know, campaigning for land. This is not permissible in Islam. Islam in Islam, there is only one kind of war which is permitted, uh, which is a war which is to uh, remove the uh, oppression uh, from the land, and uh, only that is uh, therefore permitted in Islam. So this uh, thing happened and the following year these people, the Khadrat, they returned to, uh, for Hajj with six more people. Uh, this time there were, this, these uh, people, there were, they were uh, ten from Khadraj and there were two from Al Aus. They came um, and gave their pledge to Rasulullah uh, which is called the Baya uh, Unnisa. It's called the Pledge of Women uh, because it did not include anything uh, to do with fighting. So it was only worship and so on and so forth. So that's why the it's called uh, Baya Unnisa. And this pledge was that we pledge to the Messenger of Allah at the first meeting at Aqaba that we will not associate any other God with Allah. We will not steal, we will not fornicate, we will not commit fornication. And we will not kill our children because this is what the Arabs used to do. There was female infant infanticide. Uh, we will not make fa false accusations, nor will we disobey him in anything good. 
So they made this uh, pledge. So Rasulullah said, if you keep this pledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will give you Jannah. But if you commit any of uh, these things which you have promised not to commit uh, and are punished in the world, then it will atone for you. But if you are not punished uh, in this world, then it will be for Allah to forgive you or punish you as He wills. So this was the uh, what is what came to be called as the Baitun Nisa, the uh, pledge of women, and not because they, they were all women, but because the pledge was uh, it had you know it, there was no fighting or anything else in it, uh, and that was the name it was given, the name that was given to it, and um, you know, with this, uh, uh, the, so they they took this pledge and they uh, went back. Um, Rasulullah appointed uh, Musab ibn Umair anhu, to be his ambassador and he sent them back, he sent him back with him with them uh, to Madinah. We'll talk about this in our next class, inshallah.